You guys heard the old phrase, knowing is half the battle? Knowing is half the battle? If you were to ask John, the, the writer of this epistle, I think that he would say knowing is more than half the battle. For John, knowing was the entire purpose for which he wrote this epistle. In fact, in case you haven't noticed it yet, but he w uses that word to know or knowing multiple times in the text. He says, I'm writing this letter to you that you might know. John wants us to know certain things about who God is and about who we are and what our relationship to the Lord needs to be and what it ought to look like. He's not encouraging just some superficial kind of knowledge, an acknowledgement of the principles and, and the, the, the phrases or the, the, the verses that we come across here in the text. No, no, no. John wants us to know these things experientially for our lives. He wants us to do more than just highlight our Bibles, take really good notes, maybe even pick up a commentary or two. No, no, no. John wants us to know these things in the most intimate way possible. He wants us to truly experience the Word of God. You understand that the Bible is much more than just a book of knowledge, right? It's a book of experience. It's a book for us to be able to apply to our lives, that our lives might be truly transformed and changed. You guys have heard the expression, it's not what you know, but who you know, right? When I was growing up, I've shared with you guys on my mother's side of the family, the Italian side of our family, okay, last name Corozolo, all right, you might already know where I'm going with this. We have kind of a interesting family dynamic, all right? And let me explain what I mean by interesting family dynamic. You see, my uncle, my uncle Pete, I remember thinking, even at an early age, recognizing the strange nature of my uncle Pete. My uncle Pete lived in a very, very dangerous part of New York. Brooklyn, all right? My Uncle Pete was the only Caucasian man on his block, the only one, all right? My Uncle Pete, okay, would have the nicest cars you've ever seen parked on his street, and nobody would ever mess with my Uncle Pete. He was an old man, too. I remember driving into Brooklyn and, and going to this house, and my grandfather and my grandmother, they all looking around like, oh, man, we are going into interesting part of town. This area is dangerous, you know. But as soon as we got to my Uncle Pete's house, all right, and he had that old, like, like the, the block was just covered in all these kind of, um, like, little homes, like these little duplex kind of homes, you know what I'm talking about, where you have the, the stoop in front, and everybody sits on the stoop in front, right? As soon as you got in front of that stoop, and they saw where you were parking, nobody came near your vehicle. Nobody came and messed with Uncle Pete or his family, all right? Because it wasn't what you knew, it was who you knew when you walked into that part of town, right? So too, God wants us to understand that wherever we're walking through in life, it's not about what we know about God or His Bible. It's whether or not we truly know God. That's the thing that God encourages us. Not to simply know about Him, but to truly know who He is and know Him and experience the blessings of knowing God for ourselves personally. Isn't that what we encourage here at Calvary Grace Chapel, right? First, a dedication to what? To God, right? I don't care if you know your Bible front to back. I don't care if you are the greatest philanthropist that have ever lived on this planet. If you don't know God at the very beginning, none of those things make a difference. In fact, not only is it important for us to know God, but to know God's love and to experience God's love, because without God's love, what? Everything else is useless. Everything else is fruitless. This morning, I want us to first look at three evidences. Three evidences for our walk with God that will put our heart at rest in God. Look with me at verse 19. It says, And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. What's the importance of knowing God and our hearts being put at rest? Well, note this. It demonstrates to the rest of the world that we have identified a problem in our lives and found the solution for it. Note this, guys. This is really important. 
it demonstrates to the rest of the world when it's encouraged that the people of God walk in the peace of God and in the joy of His salvation. And that which cannot be taken away, that joy, that peace, it can't be taken away. Why? Because the people of God know God. When we live that out, the rest of the world looks on and goes, well, I don't have that kind of peace. I don't have that kind of joy. And especially it's not lasting. I mean, I might get some of it if I have a really good day or versus a really bad day at work. I'll have the joy and peace if I have that really good relationship with somebody versus that really bad relationship. No, no, no. This kind of joy and peace has nothing to do with the circumstances of our life, right? Even Jesus says, peace I give to you. And before you think, and I love how he, he has to clarify what kind of peace, too. He goes, peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Let me just clarify for a second. Disciples, Christians, not as the world gives do I give to you. My peace I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be dismayed. That is what is offered in a relationship with the Lord. If you want peace and rest in your life, then you need the Lord Jesus Christ in it. It demonstrates to the rest of the world that you have identified and solved the problem. Not you personally, but you found the solution in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Isn't that what makes up a good entrepreneur? They said the key to being a really good entrepreneur is to identify a problem that everybody has and to offer the solution for it. Don't we realize that if there's ever been a problem that mankind has faced, if there's ever been a solution that they needed, it is the, sol it is the problem uh, of our lack of peace and our lack of joy. It's the problem of our, our, our sin which separates us from the love of God. You see, these are the things, understand, that are most important for this world to know that there is a solution for, that there is a hope for. And that is what John is saying here today. Again, looking at verse 19, he says, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. If you're taking note, please note verse 19. The first evidence is that we are certain of our standing. We are certain of our standing. What will give your hearts great peace and great joy, even in the midst of any circumstance or situation of life, is that you know your standing, not with this world, but with God. We are subject, or we make ourselves subject to his examination. In Psalm Chapter 139, verse 23 and 24, the psalmist writes, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The psalmist knew something. And guys, this is probably the one prayer, if we're being honest for a moment, that none of us want to pray, right? It's like, God, here I am, and I just want to have a quick prayer two-minute prayer with you. I want to tell you the things I need you to do in the course of the day for me. All right, I want to tell you all my problems, and then I need you to offer up a physical solution, a material solution to these problems that I'm facing. But the psalmist approaches it differently. Here in David, the psalmist writes to the Lord, listen, God, I understand what the real problem is. The real problem isn't around here. The real problem is right in here. Search my heart. You know my anxieties. You know the things that are bothering me internally. And you know what the real solution is for them. It's to cleanse me of my unrighteousness. That's why here John writes in verse 19, and shall assure our hearts before him, meaning we're laying our hearts before him just as the psalmist did going, Lord, search my heart. You know, I, I've often encouraged for us to take the, um, the Lord's Prayer, right, and adopt it into our own prayer life, okay? Not, not just simply repeating the Lord's Prayer, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, but really to adopt the principles that are there. And I found something very, very interesting. When I start off in the Lord's Prayer and I start off with our Father who is in heaven, that's a time of praise and thanksgiving to God for what he's done, right? It's a recognition of the greatness of God. And then, all of a sudden, I move into the next stage, which is submission to God. Not my will, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? So God, because you're so great, I'm going to surrender my entire life to you. Then I get to the next part, which is the interesting part. Give us this day our daily bread. By the time I get to need, you know what I realize? I have no idea what I really need. And because he's sovereign and because he's so great, I'm able to go, listen, you know, whatever it is that I need, 
you know how to supply it. And you actually do know what I truly need, not what I assume I need. And you're going to pro provide according to your riches and your glory. And I've got nothing to worry about because you are a great and good God. I am laying my heart before you, God, going, please, I don't even know how to fix me. You've got to fix me. You've got to fix this problem in my heart, this lack of peace, this great anxiety, this difficulty that I'm facing because I think I know the solution is. But every time I try to put my hand to fixing the problem, you know what happens? I just make it worse, right? It's like trying to wash in mud, you know? You, you look at it and you go, well, there's technically water in there. Yeah, but it's not going to make you clean, right? Trying to wash in something that's never going to be the solution to the problem that we truly face. God wants our, certain to be, our certainty to be in our standing with Him because we have laid our hearts before Him and He has said, you are clean, you're righteous, you've been forgiven. I give you my peace and my joy which can't be taken away. You're my child. Not because of how we feel about ourselves at the moment, and John's going to get to that as well in a minute. We know our standing with God because we know that the source, the source that's telling us where, our, where we stand with God is true. God is not a man that he should lie. That which God has said is clean is clean. Those who have been set free by Christ are free indeed. Right? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. These are all things we know. Let me share with you a story, if I can, for a moment. There's a story of a grand chess player, this grand master of chess, right? He goes into a art exhibit to take a look at the different artwork that's on the wall. And he's walking around. And as he walks around looking at the different paintings, he stops at one in particular. And the painting is named Checkmate. And on this painting, there's a picture. In one seat is the devil, right? And he's got this big grin on his face. He's looking down and he's smiling. And it looks from the chessboard that he is in a very advantageous position. All right? And on the cross from him, on the other side of him, is a man. And this man is in terror. The expression on his face is absolute fear. The sweat's pouring down. He looks a mess. And there's the enemy smiling. And there's this guy freaking out. And the grand the, this grandmaster of chess, right? This incredible chess player, I keep messing that word up, so just really good chess player, stands there and looks. And he spends about an hour looking at the painting, right? And he's there for over an hour, and finally the curator of the museum decides to walk on over and to stand next to him, right? And so there's the curator standing next to this chess player, and he's looking, and he says, sir, did you have any questions about this painting? And the chess player, this incredible chess player, looks over and just smiles smiles at him. And the curator goes, sir, I, I don't understand. What's so funny? And he says, he's still got one move. You see, he thought the player, the name of the painting was Checkmate. And he thought he had lost. He thought game was over. In fact, in the painting, he's ready to tip over the king to, to signify that he's done. And there the chess player looks on and goes, no, he's not done yet. He's still got another move. Christian, do you realize today, I don't care where you think you're at. I don't care how hopeless you think this life is. I don't care how many disappointments you've come, come across and have been through. God says, listen, there is still life in you. And it's not over yet. It's not over yet. I don't care how many sins are, 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 have polluted your past and tainted your story. There's still an option to put your faith in Jesus Christ. I don't care what lies the enemy has told you about yourself. I don't care what lies you have bought into about yourself. I don't care how hopeless the scenario and the situation looks for you because it's never beyond our God. Either He is truly God and he is sovereign over all things, or he's not. And if you're here gathered together, guys, as we are, and we're praising this holy God, we're praising his name here this morning, who is it that we're praising? What is it that we truly think about him? Do we really think that our life is somehow beyond his grasp? 
that he's unable to fix even the things that we've made a mess of. Maybe we've made a mess of our children. Maybe we've made a mess of our marriage, our workplaces, our careers. Maybe we've done a terrible job here this morning. Maybe we've been impatient, we've not waited on the Lord, we've not trusted on the Lord, but note this, you're still here, you're still listening to today's teaching, right? And God is saying, there's still another option. It's not over yet. Don't throw in the towel just yet. We are certain of our standing because the source of our salvation says, it's not without hope. You can be filled with this joy. You can be filled, your heart can be filled with rest and peace. You don't have to buy into that lie any longer. If you want to, you can, but you don't have to. There's other options on the table here this morning. Look with me now at verse 20. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Can I, can I share something with you guys here? I oftentimes beat myself up. I mean, just, just I'm hard on myself sometimes, guys. Some of y'all are like, you should be. <laughs> you you got to improve some things in your life, brother. Maybe so. But sometimes I will conversate with God in prayer and share with him things as if he doesn't know them. You ever done that? God, I'm really struggling here. I mean, I've made a mess of my life. Yeah, I know, because I know all things, right? God, my past is checkered with all sorts of sin and all sorts of issues. I haven't done right by you. I haven't been praying. I haven't been reading. Yep, still no, because I know all things. And here's the amazing point in the, in the promise or in the reality that God knows all things and wants us to know this about himself is guess what? Salvation and joy and peace and rest and hope are still on the table because he is good. Because we serve a good good God. It's not just the lyrics of a song, it's the reality of the life that we live in. God says, it's not over. I already knew about that sin. I already knew about that past. I already knew about that problem. And I still want you. I still want you to be a part of this kingdom. I still want you to be a part of this plan. I still want to use you. I don't care. You, you can't disqualify yourself. You know when you're disqualified? When you go up to heaven, that's it. And then, then your ministry here on earth is done. You know when, the, when there's no more hope? When you've left this world. Until then, God says, because he knows all things, listen, even when your heart lies to you. I love this verse. For if our hearts condemn us, listen, no matter what you tell yourself about yourself, no matter what lie you believe about yourself that you've bought from the enemy, understand this. God says, I'm greater than your heart. I don't care what kind of lie you've told yourself. I don't care what kind of nonsense you've told yourself. I don't care what kind of lie you've convinced yourself. Oh, no, God can't use you. God doesn't want you. You know? God says, listen, I don't care about that stuff. Because I'm greater than your heart. Ever, ever gone through a real funk? You know what I'm talking about? Like just a real deep depression. Like, oh, man, life is tough. Man, I, I'm just worthless. I'm useless. I'm, I'm nonsense. I'm, I'm garbage. I've made a mess of my life. I've ruined my kids. I've ruined my spouse. That's why I don't have a spouse. I mean, whatever you tell, you ever gone through that stuff where you are so deep in it that that's all you hear and that's all you see? All you see is darkness all around you. And it doesn't feel like there's any possibility that you're going to get out of that. You guys know what I'm talking about? Or am I just making stuff up as I go along? No, you know. You know what God says? I'm greater than that. I'm greater than that. That lie, that's not true. I wrote, I'm the way, the truth, and life. I know what truth is. Don't you think God, no, listen, if it wasn't true, don't you think he would have told us? Don't you think, man, listen, I, I, I can only be honest with people. I can only be truthful because I am truth, right? This is God here speaking. And he says, don't you think I would have told you? Don't you think I would have let you know if there wasn't hope? If there wasn't shot at this, if he couldn't give you your peace despite your circumstances, yeah, I guess that's right. I mean, you're making a good point there, Pastor Ryan. It's not my point. It's God's. He says, I'm greater than the lies that your own heart. This is why the Bible says, our heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. It's li it lies. It lies a lot. 
And that's why we need to continuously go to Him to be filled with His Holy Spirit and to read His Word that we might understand the truth. Despite what it looks like, it's not that way. You know what, you know what makes a really good movie for me? It's when you presume to know how it's going to end and then it flips it on you. You know, you're like, man, I thought I knew how this movie was going to end, right? I had an Avengers Endgame spoiler that I promised Andrew I wasn't going to use. But I knew how that movie was going to end. And it, it, it flipped it on me. I was like, all right, all right, that was clever. I won't see, that's not a spoiler. It's good. Do you guys know what I'm talking about here? The guy says, you're presuming to know how this thing... Let me ask you a question without a show of hands. I know I am. I, I wrestle with this thing called vain imagination. You know what vain imagination is? Vain imagination goes like this. Your morning starts off, right? You forget to pray, maybe. You forget to read your word. You get into it. You get a quick devotion in because you just want to make sure that your, your mind is focused on the Lord. And then all of a sudden you get some bad news. Maybe you get laid off from work. Maybe your spouse is upset with you. Maybe your kids are acting... A, a fool, you know, they're just all over the place, right? And then you, here's what you do. You start to tell yourself, well, this is punishment because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And then it goes on, right? It doesn't stop there. Now, you've, now you have this idea about who God is, right? And that he's punishing you because he's mad at you, right? And not realizing that he knew all things. He already, he already knew that you were going to have a tough time this morning. And then you go on and you go, now it's all going to fall apart. The whole day is going to be garbage now. This is going to go to crap now. And then on top of that, you know, my marriage is going to be done. My wife's leaving me today. I know it. She's gone. She's gone. I'd leave me. And then, you know, I'm going to go into work. My boss is going to lay me off. And then I'm going to be broke. And then after that, I'm going to be sleeping outside. I just know it. I'm going to, you know, become alcoholic. And Where did that come from? Maybe you don't have that bad of vain imagination. All right? <laughs> But you know what I'm talking about. You play out your, the next 10 years of your life, you know that there's no way to fix it. God's saying, that's not how this works, man. You realize that Jesus changed the course of 12 people directly. 12 people in the course of one day. He walked up to some fishermen and said, follow me. Change the course of their life. One day. Tax collector. Follow me. A murderer. Follow me. One day he did it in. What can God not do in your life? What can he do? What can he restore? What can he fix? What sin can't he forgive you of? Name it. Write it down. Try to figure it out. I challenge you. I remember sitting down. My brother, we were at a, a dinner with some family members of ours. My cousin brought her new fiance in. He's a mathematician, like he's he's like some college ed educated guy, knows his stuff, right? And so my brother comes up to you guys ever heard this like uh, it's like a riddle about a dollar and getting some change back, and it's it's basically this unsolvable math problem. It's, it's a real ma math problem that exists. So my brother, being cute and funny, decides to ask the mathematician right this question, and, and the mathematician can't answer it. But he doesn't stop there. Not only can he not answer it, but he gets ticked off, right? That he doesn't have the solution to the problem, right? Rather than just recognizing and realizing that he actually doesn't know everything, right? How simpler would life be? How much easier would it be for us if we just went, you know what? I don't have all the answers, but God does. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to find peace in this situation, but he does. I don't know how this is going to work out for good, according to Romans 8.38, right? All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. God, I have no problem admitting to you right now. I have no idea how this is good. There is no way I can conceive of a possible way, possible scenario, and God goes, don't worry about it, because I know all things. I know all things. Will you trust me? Do you believe that I'm sovereign? Continuing on, verse 20. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. We have gladness in grace, merriment in His mercy, 
despite the fact, maybe we've laid our hearts before the Lord. Again, right, guys? That's what we're doing. We're laying our hearts before the Lord. Search me, O Lord. And then God goes, well, actually, there's an issue. This is what we need to correct. This is what we need to fix. You know it. It's been there for a long time. You've been wrestling with this depression. You've been wrestling with this lack of joy, this lack of peace, this inability to trust me with this sin. You've been wrestling with it for years. You wanted me to, you wanted me to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you now and say, here is your problem. Here is the issue at hand. Now, what are we going to do to fix it? And here's the beautiful thing about that. He says, listen, I'm greater than that. I can conquer that in your life. I can fix that. You see, conviction, note this, there is a difference. Conviction, the revelation that there is something wrong that needs to be addressed. Conviction is a gift from the Holy Spirit. But condemnation is a tool that the enemy uses to render us inactive. We feel so bad about ourselves, we feel so sorry for ourselves, that you know what we do? Nothing. Oh, forget it, I'm hopeless. There's no, pro there's no point in doing this anymore. It's one of the... The, the key tactical strategies, thank you, key tactical strategies of the enemy, I believe, in taking people out of church. God wants you in church. You realize that, right? God wants you inside the body of Christ. You know what the enemy wants you to do? Feel sorry for yourself. It, you know, I can't go to church. I'm just not, I'm not the right fit. You know, those are holy people. Those are good people. Those are people that love God. Those are people that never struggle. Those are people that have lots of money. Those are people that are rich. Those are people... No. Absolutely not. In fact, it's when we're sinning, it's when we're struggling, it's when we're wrestling that God says, that's where you really need to be. Right? Sorry, Doc. I didn't want to go to the doctors today because I was feeling really sick. I would much rather come to you when I'm feeling a lot healthier. I mean, I don't want to come when I actually need something like a prescription or surgery or something like that. I, I was planning on waiting, you know, until I feel better on my own. I was going to fix it myself. And then I was going to come to you and show it off. Like, hey, check out what I did. What do you think of that? I removed my own appendix, you know? <laughs> Doctor, look at you. What's wrong with you? And God's, going to say, God's saying the same thing. Why are you trying to fix yourself? You can't do that. That's my job. That's what I created the church there for. That's what I gave that person gifts and talents for, to be able to minister to you, to be able to serve you, because you can't fix this. There's no possible way that you can fix this. Listen, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. All right? It's like the number one thing that people, especially married couples, hate doing. It's called marriage counseling. You guys know what marriage counseling is? Yeah, that's when your marriage is really, really bad. And stuff is going all sorts of wrong and sideways. And that's like, that's like you, know, you don't want to have to do that. That means that you're really screwed up, right? Guess what? Your pastor gets marriage counseling. I do, right? I get marriage counseling. Now, we like to dress it up a little bit differently and call it something a little different. Like, you know, we need some fellowship with Pastor Ryan down at Calvary Deerfield and his wife, Joy. Yeah, that's what we need. Because I'm screwed up, guys. I know what I need. And I'd be a fool. I'd be a fool to ignore when I need something. That's not how stuff gets fixed. You know the reason why the Bible says, confess your sins one to another, that you may be healed? Because God knows that you need healing. I need healing. There are times where we need stuff to get fixed. There are times that we need to rely upon the Lord. In fact, we shouldn't be just part of the time. It should be all the time that we're relying on the Lord. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 says this. So the great dragon, this is talking about Satan, was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren, that's Satan, who accused them before God, before our God, day and night, has been cast down. He thinks he won. He stands there with a big grin on his face, looking down on your life going, I got him. And God's saying, 
No, he didn't. He didn't get you. It's not over yet. You don't have to believe that lie. He's actually lost. He lost a long time ago. Do you realize that, that Satan lost? I mean, that, that might be something that, that you have to reconcile here today. He lost. He absolutely lost. There's no chance. I, I, I find it hilarious when they put these movies together and stuff like that where it's like good versus evil and, and there's a chance that evil might actually win. No, he lost. He lost the game. It's over for him. He knows it. Time is ticking. And all he wants to do is, note this, deceive the world into believing that he actually has a chance, that he actually has victory over you. Because note this, it says, and they, speaking of us, church, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. God saying, hey, listen, church, there's good news. You won, he lost, by my blood, and listen, now you have a word of testimony to let everybody else know around you that you won and he lost. And you don't have to believe the lie of the enemy which says, oh, no, 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 I, I won. I'm victorious. I, I got you. You're, you're unfixable. Your, your marriage, your ministry, your life is a wreck. It's never going to amount to anything. You don't have to believe that. And you could choose to if you want to. But how silly. Listen, you can go to the doctor's office and the doctor could say, hey, listen, there's good news. You're cancer-free. You're cancer-free. You don't have to worry about that. It's over. It's gone. It's done. And you could still subject yourself to all the radiation and all the chemo and more surgeries if you want to. But how silly would that be? When he says, you've been set free. Why don't we believe him? For me, for my kids, I actually should say, there's nothing worse than spending hours, hours putting together Legos, right? You get your kids a big Lego kit, right? And they spend hours putting this Lego creation together, right? They found the directions. I got this. Look at this monster thing we're putting together, right? And then to get to the very end and look at it and go, something's missing. Something's not right here. Or you're trying to put it together, and for some reason, that last big connection that has to take place, all of a sudden, it doesn't work. And you're going, what's going on here? There's a problem, right? And for some of us, our lives are missing one crucial piece to this puzzle. One crucial piece. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's trying to walk with God without God. How crazy is that? People do it all the time. I'm walking with the Lord. Yeah, where is He? I don't know. I lost Him somewhere. Where's God? Where's God evidence in your life? Where's the peace and joy that he promises? Where is it evidence in your life? I have no idea. Then maybe you're missing a piece. Then maybe you're missing this peace in your life. And listen, it's not that peace, just the feeling good, the goosebumps. It's the peace of the Lord in your life. God's saying, I don't want you to miss out on this peace anymore. You know, we... Sometimes we construct our lives because we think we have it together so well, right? And we put this piece here, and we got this piece here, and we fit it all together exactly how we want, right? And then we look on at it, and we're really dissatisfied. We're really dissatisfied. You know why? Because it looks like a really warped Jenga puzzle. And it's just waiting to fall apart. Somebody pulls the right piece, or the wrong piece, I should say, at the right time, and boom, that whole thing falls apart. I know Christian's life, it looks like this giant twisted up jangle, Jenga puzzle, right? right? And then one thing goes wrong in their life, and guess what? <sighs> There's no God. There's no love. My life is miserable. Everything's just falling apart. I'm miserable. It's because we don't have the Lord. Tower of Babel. You guys remember the story? Tower of Babel? Fell, right? It was, it was stopped in its tracks. Why? Because they try to build it without God. We're going to get to heaven on our own. We're going to do this without God all by ourselves. We don't need God in our lives. It didn't work out so well. And how many other examples do we need in our life? In Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. We're going to get real here for a second. 
All right. Verse 4. It says, so about 3,000 men went up there, went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Let me get your attention in case you're confused by what's going on. The nation of Israel is walking into the promised land, right? They're taking, they're taking over the promised land. They're out on a conquest, right? And as they're out conquering the land, you know, the Lord's giving them victory. All of a sudden, they come to one battle, and they're defeated. And they're defeated, and they lose, right? And they're feeling pretty miserable. They're feeling pretty rotten about themselves, right? And, and, and note with me, it says, it got, God had allowed them to be struck down, and the hearts of the people melted and became like water, right? All of a sudden, we're on that mountaintop experience, right? Best service today I've ever heard, Pastor Ryan. This was awesome. I just needed to hear this. Thank you so much for sharing. No problem, all right? Just so you know. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Anyways, you're on that mountaintop experience, right? And then you start, you don't even get to Monday, all right? You get home. You just get home. And all of a sudden, it ain't what you expected. Kids are acting up. Husband's not acting right. Now you walk into an empty house because you don't have a spouse with you, right? All of a sudden, the lies of the enemy, the darts, the fiery darts of the enemy, pew, 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 right? Just starts firing away. And all of a sudden, your heart becomes like water and it's melted. Because it didn't go down the way I thought it was going to go down. It didn't go down the way I expected it to. God, you were supposed to provide victory. That means everything's supposed to be great in my life. No losses. And then God says to them, watch this, or I should say, then Joshua tore his clothes. This man of God tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? Why'd you even save me, God? Why'd you even do that? Why'd you even start? Why'd you get my hopes up, God? Right? It sounds like he's feeling pretty miserable, doesn't it? Sounds, sounds like he's feeling pretty sorry for himself right now. God, why would you ever do this? Why would you ever give me a hard day? Why wouldn't you give me the desires of my heart, God? I'm supposed to be one of your people. Why are you blessing them? They don't walk with you. They don't honor you the way that I do. This man of God stands before God now all day, all night, feeling sorry for himself, throws dirt on his head, right? I would say this is a pretty serious scene. And then it goes on. Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people out over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Talk about vain imagination, right? How many people, does anybody remember roughly how many people went over the Jordan? Over a million. Guess how many they lost? 36. 36, right? Why did you ever bring us here? Why would you ever... Well, listen, we're going to be destroyed. A million people. Now, utterly destroyed by the Amorites because they lost 36. Wait, it goes on. Oh, that we have been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. You know, he's not saying it, but he's saying it. It would have been better if we dwelt in Egypt, right? He doesn't want to say it directly because he knows that's what got them in trouble. You remember? Oh, for the days of leeks and onions. Oh, it would have been better in Egypt. That's what he's referencing here. This, this commander, this general, this mighty man of God, feeling sorry for himself right now. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth, then what will you do for, the great, for your great name? He's feeling gutsy. He's feeling gutsy here, guys. goes on, so the Lord said to Joshua. You ready for God's response here, guys? This is important. This is the part we don't like as much. Get up! Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put it, I'm sorry, and they have also put it among them. 
among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they've become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before the enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Does it sound like God sympathized? I know you might say, well, you were yelling, all right? There was an exclamation point. I had a right to, all right? God was serious. He says, get up. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. He goes, because of what you have done and what you have allowed into your own heart, the lies that you bought into from the enemy, that is what is destroying your life. It's not that you lost 36 people. It's not that you had a bad day. It's not that you didn't get what you wanted. It's not that God didn't do for you the way that you were expecting him to do for you. He says, get up and stop feeling sorry for yourself. He says, is it not enough that you have been given the blood of the Lamb and the word of His testimony? The enemy is done and defeated. If you want to give Him victory, that's on you. You've allowed that into your life, but it doesn't have to be that way. Get up. Listen, I know that there are tough days. I know that there are hard days, guys. Believe me when I tell you, I get it. Now is not the time to feel sorry for ourselves. We have the blood of the Lamb. We have been set free. We have a peace which transcends all understanding. We have a hope and a joy which cannot be taken away. And even when we feel like we've lost some things, God says, listen, you've lost nothing. You've lost nothing. You've been given much. And even if you lose some things, as Job had to learn for himself, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. And here's the beautiful thing about God's giving. It's always more than whatever whatever he allows to be taken away, guys. In fact, one of the things that God often is interested in taking away is the sin in our midst, which is causing our defeat. That's what God wants to take away from the nation Israel. He doesn't want to take away their victory. That was their decision. He just wants to get rid of that which is in their life, which is causing sin and more depression and more despair and more hopelessness and a lack of peace. That's what he wants. And we're going, no, God, you just want to take things from me. You just want to ruin my life. You should have left me over. You should have left me without salvation. You should have left me in the world. Really? That's where you think you would have found hope and peace? There's a lot of people there. I don't think they have it. My daughter sometimes gets real emotional, all right? It's true, I know. You guys might not believe this, right? She's, she's, she's an emotional girl. And so in my house recently, my kids and me, I'm guilty of this, it's not picking, please understand, we try to make a joke about being overly emotional sometimes. Because it's a good reminder that perhaps we're making a bigger deal out of something that we ought to, and making light of it, can help. So what we do is now my boys have even gotten really good at it. When Eden is throwing a temper tantrum or getting in her emotions, there's a song by Reliant K called Mood Rings. All right? And if you haven't heard of it, I will share with you part of the chorus. It says, let's get emotional girls to all wear mood rings. So when they're ticked off, we'll be tipped off. And my sons have think that's hilarious. All right? Now, Eden, at first, did not like this. Why would you presume that she didn't like this? Well, you know, you're pointing out that I'm emotional and that I'm being silly about things, right? And so she didn't like it. But now, all of a sudden, when she hears the song come on, all of a sudden, she just starts dancing. She's like, you're right. Why am I getting so emotional? Like, has a blast with it. And that's what the Lord is probably impressing upon some of our hearts here today, including my own. Like, Ryan, why are you getting so emotional about this? Why are you getting so ridiculous? And I don't mean emotions in a bad way, because not all emotions are bad. I'm talking about the kind that leads to despair and depression and a lack of peace and a lack of joy. Why am I getting all worked up about that? You see how many people showed up for church today, Lord? 
you know, I was hoping there'd be more people. I mean, it's Mother's Day, and I thought all mothers want to go out to church on Mother's Day. You know, I, I put together this really good teaching. It was at least a couple hours I put into preparation for it. And now the people that I wanted to hear it aren't even in here. They're not hearing it. And Ryan, why are you getting so, so upset about it? Why do you feel so bad for yourself? Just, just enjoy. You know, I'm serving the Lord. I'm serving Him faithfully, and I'm still broke, and God's not showing up. Why are you so upset about it? Has He not provided you? For you? You hungry? Did you ask anybody for food? I mean, what's what's going on in your life? Well, nothing. To, I mean, it's not that bad. I just would like more things and be on sorry. And that's the lie of the enemy. That's where the enemy wants to take us. So that watch this. We're not convicted over what's in our midst, what we've allowed into our hearts, but now we're condemned and defeated by it. So we do absolutely nothing with it. Even this morning, you're, you, you start hearing this word, and you're like, you know, it's me. But I'm never going to change. I'm, not, I'm, you know, Pastor Ryan's even making fun of me now, saying I'm feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> he doesn't even like me. I know my wife told me about it, you know, told him about me and what's going on. That's why he's saying these things right now. Wrong. Note this last point. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. Guys, hear me. If our hearts do not condemn us, it's because we have confidence towards God. Why? Because we believe Him. Because we've moved from a place of a lack of trust and a lack of belief in who God is and what He can do, and we move to a place where, you know what? You're right. Here's the beautiful thing about Joshua. He hears God. He says, you know what, you're right. we got to get rid of this sin and let's get back to work. we got to remove this funk from our heart and let's get back to it. Why am I feeling sorry for myself? Why am I saying these things which are not true? It was the conviction of the Holy Spirit that brought him to a place where, you know what, I've got to do something with this. I've got to do something. We have confidence in God, not in the flesh, we have boldness in the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is birthed from a place of understanding who God is, and watch this, what His desire is for our lives. Proverbs 3.26 says, for the, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Know that He who begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Know that it's not all hopeless. It's not all despair. It's not all misery. We serve a good God. A good God. And there is no other good God out there. Listen, work ain't going to be good to you all the time. Your spouse ain't going to be good to you all the time. Your family ain't going to be good to you all the time. Your kids ain't going to be good to you all the time. The strangers ain't going to be good to you all the time. Watch this. The church and myself, I'm not going to be good to you all the time. But you serve a good God. And that is where our confidence is to come from. Who God is and what He's done in our lives. Jeremiah 29, 11, you know it well. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. God's saying, don't you for a second tell me what I think about you and who you are and what you're capable of doing. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. You're not going to tell me what my thoughts are. That's what God's saying to us here. You're not going to believe that lie from the enemy. I know what I think about you. I know the plans that I have for your life. I do. Why would you listen to anybody else? Do we understand God's heart towards us, guys? God will do whatever it takes to convey this message to us. In fact, 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Over the last, I want to say, few years, it was before I took over ministry for Pastor Jim and started serving, I have wrestled, personally wrestled, with feelings of disappointment, inadequacy, God, I'm not doing it right. I mean, I, I thought I, I thought there'd be more people. I thought I'd be at a better place in my career, be earning more money. 
I don't even think I do well with my kids all the time. Like, man, I'm struggling with them sometimes. My wife, you know, she's struggling with me, you know. And I've wrestled, I want you to hear me on this, guys, with depression for years. And I'm not talking about the kind that's like, oh, I'm having a bad day. I'm talking about that heavy depression where it's like there ain't nothing. There ain't no point in me going on. In fact, it's gotten so bad recently that I've started wrestling with thoughts of suicide and, and, and leaving. And you go, wait a second. Are you serious? serious? And I'm not asking you guys to come up, oh, Pastor Ryan, you're doing a great job. No, 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 no. Hear me on this. I know what happens when you listen to the lies of the enemy for too long. What it robs you of. What it robs you of. All the years, the opportunities that it robs you of to minister to people, just love on people and enjoy your life. Guys, I don't want to give up. I don't. And I'm not going to. I sat in my car the other night. I knew it was coming on because sometimes you just you could tell when those feelings are starting to come on. Thursday night I'm driving home. I had a rough day. And immediately, of course now, these that rough day turns into this depression, this defeat. And immediately the thoughts are from, you know what? That church would be so much better off without you. That, that wife of yours, man, she would do so much better off. Those kids, there are better Christians out there that could raise those kids. Those, all these thoughts are fun. And I said, Enough! No more! Enough of this garbage! I'm not going to stay defeated. I'm not going to live in that despair any longer. Because that's a lie from the pit of hell. That's pretend. That's not real. That's not what God said. None of that is. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to take these thoughts... The Bible says that we're to bring every thought into captivity that's not from Him. Every last one of them. And God says, Ryan, you've got stuff to go do, man. You've got people to go minister to. You've got love to start sharing with people. You've got a gospel. You've got a hope. You've got the blood of the Lamb and the word of His testimony. No longer are you going to sit and wrestle with this any longer and allow it to have victory over you. Listen, it doesn't mean that you're not going to struggle with depression or with a bad day or thoughts that aren't from God. But God's promise, the victory, is that we have overcome these things by the blood of the Lamb and the word of His testimony. Listen to me. One last area of Scripture I'm going to share. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 11 through 11. Do you not know, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? God says, unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes on. He says, do not be deceived. Don't be lied to here. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You say, this is a terrible verse to end on, Pastor Ryan. Because I'm all of those things. I've done those things. What do you mean? I'm in real trouble here. And then he goes on to say, and such were some of you. God knows it, right? Because he knows all things. He goes, and such were some of you. It was me. He says, but you were washed. Hear this, guys, and believe this. And if you haven't believed it yet, don't leave here without putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Because he says, despite who you were and what your struggles were, and what type of darkness has filled your heart? And what kind of lies you have believed for too long? He says, God says, you were washed. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of God. That's His promise. That's the truth. That's the gospel truth. Any other story? That my heart, that your heart, that another person's words tell you is a complete and utter fabrication. John says, I wrote these things to those who are in the truth, that they might know. 
you want the peace of God in your life, then put it to rest. Get up. No more feeling sorry for yourself. Know that where you stand in the Lord. Know that He loves you tremendously and gave His Son for you. Know that He has a purpose and a plan for your life. Know that there is no enemy which is not overcome by His work. Amen.